Okay, so this is the video uh, for the Maths Mock, uh, Higher Level Maths uh, 2020, uh, Paper 2. This is the DB paper. Um, and just, I suppose, in comparison to Paper 1, this paper was an awful lot easier. Um, and that's just gone by by students in my own school um, and feedback that I got from, from other students um, and even just looking, going through the papers myself, uh, paper one was uh, quite difficult, paper two uh, wasn't too bad at all. Um, so there'll be timestamps for each question in the description and in the comments. If you have any questions, just ask in the comments below and I should hopefully get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, so let's jump straight in. Okay, so question one, um, a geometry question. Uh, the points A, which is minus two, minus three, uh, B, which is four, nine, and C, which is minus four, three, are shown in the diagram below. Find the equation of the line through the midpoint of AB, which is perpendicular to AB. So just drawing a bit of a sketch here might help you uh, to figure out what, uh, what they want. So the midpoint of AB, let's say, is somewhere around there. And they want the equation of the line that is perpendicular to AB through there. So this line here, they want to find the equation of that line there. So in order to get uh, the equation of that line, we would need a point. Uh, the midpoint of AB would be a point that's on it. And then we would need the slope as well. And the slope will be um, the, uh, the opposite of the slope for AB. So if we find the slope of AB and the midpoint of, the, of AB, then we'll be able to get the equation of that new line. So um, I'm going to start with the midpoint of AB. So uh, that's x1 plus x2 over 2, comma y1 plus y2 over 2. Now I'm going to just say that is x1 y1 and that is x2 y2. So filling in, we have minus 2 plus 4 over 2, and we have y1 is minus 3 plus 9 over 2. So uh, minus 2 plus 4 is 2, 2 divided by 2 is 1, and then minus 3 plus 9 is 6, 6 divided by 2 is 3. So the midpoint is 1, 3. Midpoint is 1, 3. You can mark it in on the diagram if you like. Now we also need the slope of AB. So the slope is M is equal to uh, Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So filling in what we know, uh, Y2 is 9 minus Y1. So that's minus minus 3 over X2, which is 4 minus x1, which is minus 2. So 9 minus minus 3 is 12, and 4 minus minus 2 is 6. So the slope is 12 over 6, which is 2. Now, the perpendicular slope then, so m perpendicular, is going to be equal to minus 1 over 2. So remember, if the slope of a line is 2, then to get the perpendicular slope uh, inverted, so 2 over 1 becomes 1 over 2, and then change the sign as well. So the m perpendicular is minus a half. So now the equation of the new line, so it's uh, the equation of a, of a line is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. And we have m, x1, and y1. So y minus, now our y1 and our x1 are now the midpoint. Okay, so uh, y1 is 3. So y minus 3 is equal to minus a half times x minus 1. And then we can just tidy it. It doesn't ask for any particular um, any particular way to write it out, but we'll just get rid of the fractions and, and write it as uh, neatly as we can. So multiply across by two, that'll be two y minus six equals uh, minus, uh, then times x, and then minus one times minus one is plus one. So uh, two y 
is equal to minus x plus 1 uh, plus 6 is plus 7. So you could leave it like that if you wanted, um, or you could divide by the 2 to have the slope and the y-intercept, whatever, um, whatever you feel like yourself. It doesn't uh, specify what form to have it in. Part B then, use your answer to part A to find the coordinates of the circumcenter of the triangle ABC. Now, the circumcenter of a triangle is the point that uh, the, the perpendicular bisectors where, where they will intersect. So this is a perpendicular bisector. We want another perpendicular bisector, for example, the perpendicular bisector of AC. So that would be there, um, something like this, okay? So this point here, give or take, will be the perpendicular bisector. So we're gonna have to do Sorry, this point here will be the circumcenter. It's the intersection of the perpendicular bisectors. So we're going to have to do the same as what we did in part A, except this time for the line AC, and then find the point of intersection of our two lines that we got. So that would be the point of intersection of this line and of the new line that we're going to get. Okay, so let's uh, start by getting the midpoint of AC. So midpoint, uh, again, the formula, uh, x1 plus x2 over 2 uh, and y1 plus y2 over 2. Now I'll just write down what x1, y1 is. So it's AC. So it's minus 2 minus 3. That's the point A. And the point C is minus 4, 3. So that's x1, y1, x2, y2. So filling in. We have uh, x1 plus x2, so that's minus 2 minus 4 over 2, and y1 plus y2, so that's minus 3 plus 3 over 2. So minus 2 minus 4 is minus 6, minus 6 divided by 2 is minus 3, minus 3 plus 3 is 0, divided by 2 is 0. So that minus 3, 0 is the midpoint. Now we need to find the slope as well. So M of AC, so the slope of AC. Remember slope is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So that would be uh, Y2 is three minus minus three over uh, X2, which is minus four. Uh, minus minus 2. So that then is equal to 3 minus minus 3 is 6 and minus 4 minus minus 2 is minus 2. So the slope then is 6 divided by minus 2 which is minus 3. So the slope of AC is minus 3. Then we need the perpendicular slope. Uh, so M perpendicular again. So like before, we changed the sign and we inverted. So uh, minus 3, this perpendicular slope would be 1 over 3. Now we can find the equation of the perpendicular bisector. So the equation, which is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So filling in then... Um, our x1, y1 is minus 3, 0, and our m is a third. So y minus 0 is equal to a third times x minus x1, which is 3, so x plus 3. So that's y is equal to uh, a third x, or x over 3, and then a third times 3 is 1. So that is the equation of the perpendicular bisector. Now I'm going to put that with the other one, 2y equals minus x plus 7, and solve these two equations together to find the coordinates of the circumcenter. So let's take these up here. Now, this is solving um, simultaneous equations. Um, just looking at the way it is now, I can probably just sub in, because I have y here as x over 3 plus 1. I could sub that in here, and that might be the easiest way to do it. So 2 times x over 3 plus 1 
is equal to minus x plus 7. So 2 times x over 3 is 2x over 3. 2 times 1 is 2. It was minus x plus 7. I'm going to multiply across by 3. Uh, 2x plus 6 is equal to minus 3x plus 21. Take the x's to one side, numbers to the other. So um, minus 3x and 2x, that'll be 5x on the left-hand side. And then 21 minus 6 is 15. So that means x is equal to 3. Now, if x is equal to 3, just take this one down here and we can get y is equal to 3 over 3 plus 1. So that is equal to 3 over 3 is 1 plus 1 is 2. So the point of the coordinates of the circumcenter, uh, we can just say the circumcenter equals uh, 3, comma, 2. So going back to the diagram there, uh, 3, 2, uh, somewhere over, over here, okay? Question two then, uh, the circle S has center uh, seven minus eight and passes through the point P, which is uh, two minus two. Find the equation of the circle S. So the equation of a circle, so we use the general equation formula, which is X minus H squared plus y minus k squared uh, equals to or squared, where the center is equal to hk. And in this case, that's 7 minus 8. Now, the only other thing that we need in order to get this is the radius. Okay, so we just need to find the radius. Now, the radius is going to be the distance between the center and any point on the circle. So radius is equal to the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So that's just the uh, distance formula. We'll let that be x1, y1. That will be x2, y2. So radius then is equal to the square root of uh, x2 minus x1. So that's 2 minus 7 squared plus y2 minus y1 minus 2 minus 8 squared so or is equal to the square root of 2 minus 7 is minus 5 minus 5 squared is 25 be careful with your signs there especially if you're doing that bit on the calculator make sure you have your brackets plus uh, minus 2 minus 8 is minus 10 minus 10 squared is 100 so or is equal to the square root of 125. Now, I've just noticed that I made a mistake there. Minus y1. y1 is minus 8. So that should be minus 2 minus minus 8, which is plus 8. So minus 2 plus 8 is 6. 6 squared is actually 36. So uh, not 100, like I said there. So the or then is equal to the square root of 25 plus 36, which is root 61. So that is or. Now I can fill everything into my general equation. So x minus h squared. So h is 7. So that's x minus 7 squared plus y minus k. Now k is minus 8. So that'll be plus 8. So y plus 8 squared is equal to or squared. So that's root 61 squared. And then one more step, x minus 7 squared plus y plus 8 squared is equal to root 61 squared is 61. Now you can leave it like that. Um, there is no need to multiply it out, but if you want to, you can multiply it out and put it in uh, kind of the general, uh, the general form. But leaving it like that is absolutely fine. Part two then, uh, Q is, a, is the point on the circle S that is closest to the x-axis. Find in third form the coordinates of Q. Okay, so a diagram would be best to demonstrate this. So I'm just going to draw a quick sketch of what the circle looks like. Okay, it has its center at 
uh, 7 minus 8. Okay, so let's just estimate there. It's, it's around about here, 7 minus 8. And then it is like this and it has a radius of root 61. So we say C is 7 minus 8. Now, this is the point here that's going to be closest to the x-axis. Okay, so what's its x-coordinate? Its x-coordinate is 7. Okay, so um, let's... Uh, call this point is a Q. So Q is the point seven. And then the Y coordinate of it, well, it's minus eight plus root 61. So we can actually just write it like that, minus eight plus root 61. So they wanted it in third form. So that's absolutely fine there like that. So the point, the coordinates at this point Q are seven and the Y coordinate is minus eight plus root 61. Now, part B, uh, so the point OR is also on the circle. Uh, the length of the chord P OR is 10 units. The, the diagram shows OR1 and OR2, which are two possible values of OR. So this is OR1, this is OR2, so two possible uh, values. Find the possible equations of P OR. So that'd be find the equation of this line and the equation of this line. Now, um, we should just write in a few things that we know. So. I'm going to work on, on this one here first. Um, so the length of this line here is 10. Okay, that's given P or is 10. We also need to remember the coordinates of P, which are given over here. Uh, the coordinates of P are 2 minus 2. So P is 2 minus 2. Okay, so um, we want to find... Uh, the equation of, of these two lines. So what do we need to know about them? We need to know a point on them. Well, we do, we know a point on them. Then we need to know the slope. So basically I need the slope of this line here. Now, now let's um, start by seeing if we can work out what the equation of this line is. Well, the equation of a line is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Now what do we know? We know x1, y1, so that's y. Uh, y1 is minus 2, so that's plus 2 is equal to m. Now we don't know m, so I'm going to just put it down as m times x minus x1. x1 is 2, so x minus 2. Now this might look familiar to you. You've done questions like this before. Uh, where you have an unknown m in there and you're looking for two lines, okay? So let's just uh, go with this for a second. We'll just uh, work this out. Uh, y plus 2 is equal to mx minus 2m. And then what we usually do with this is we put it in the form of ax plus by plus c. So that would be mx uh, minus y minus 2m minus 2 equal to 0. That's ax plus by plus c. Now what do we usually do with this? We usually use the perpendicular distance formula. So we can actually find the perpendicular distance from c to p or this distance here. We can find that distance using Pythagoras and then we can use the perpendicular distance formula to find our two slopes m. So using Pythagoras, I have this triangle here. Uh, this is a radius, so this is root 61. Uh, it's also the hypotenuse. This length here is half of the 10, so that's five. So that gives me a triangle. I'll write it in, draw it in the same orientation. Root 61, five, and let's call that uh, x there, our unknown number. So that's the right angle. So root 61 squared is equal to 5 squared plus x squared. So x squared is equal to 61 minus 25. So then x is equal to the square root of 61 minus 25. 61 minus 25 is 36. So x is equal to the square root of 36, which is 6. So I have my perpendicular distance from C to uh, P or. Now I can use that 
and now the perpendicular distance formula okay so let's write down the perpendicular distance formula so uh, the perpendicular distance is equal to the absolute value of a x1 plus b y1 plus c over the square root of a squared plus b squared now what are all my values well a is equal to m b is equal to minus 1 c is equal to minus 2m minus 2 and then i have my point x1 y1 my point x1 y1 is the center here and the center uh, was from earlier on uh, 7 minus 8 so 7 minus 8 I also know D, my distance, which is six. So I have nearly everything. I can sub in for everything here into this formula, and then I'll just be left with one unknown, which is M, and I can solve for that then. So let's sub in everything that we know. So subbing in six is equal to the absolute value of A, which is M, X1 is seven, plus B was minus one, times y1, which was minus eight, uh, plus c, that's minus two m minus two, all over the square root of a squared plus b squared. So that's m squared plus minus one squared. So working through that, six is equal to the absolute value of seven m, uh, plus 8 minus 2m minus 2 over uh, the square root of m squared plus 1. Okay, working through simplifying them even more. 6 is equal to uh, 7m minus 2m is 5m. Uh, and then 8 minus 2 is plus 6 over the square root of m squared plus 1. At this stage, then, we have two things going on. We have the square root underneath uh, the, on the denominator, and we also have this uh, absolute values uh, on the top. So to get rid of both of them, what we do is we square everything. So I'm going to square the 6, square this here, and square this one here. So 6 squared, then, is 36. Uh, squaring 5m plus 6. So squared first, 25m squared twice the product, product is 5m plus 6, uh, 5m times uh, 6, which is 30m, times 2, which is 60m, and then 6 squared is 36, and then on the bottom square in that, you get m squared plus 1. Multiply across both sides by, uh, by m squared plus 1, I'm going to get 36m squared plus 36, and then at the same time, I'm going to take everything to the left-hand side. So it'll be minus 25m squared minus 60m minus 36 is equal to 0. Tidying up everything, 36m squared minus 25m squared. That gives 11m squared. I have minus 60m. And then I have 36 minus 36 is 0. So that's equal to zero. So my equation is 11m squared minus 60m. I'm just gonna make some room here. To factorize that, you take out m and you'd be left with 11m minus 60 equal to zero. So that gives me two values for m. It gives me m is equal to zero and it gives 11m equals 60 so m is equal to 60 over 11 so they are my two slopes and hopefully you can see which one uh, corresponds to which line so m equal to 0 would be p or 2 and m equal to 60 over 11 would be this one here uh, p or 1 so i'm looking for uh, the equation of the two lines so i just need to sub in these two values into this that I got earlier on, which was my equation of each line. So we'll start with m equal to zero. 
So that'd be 0 times x minus y minus 2 times 0 minus 2 is equal to 0. So that's minus y uh, minus 2 is equal to 0. So minus y is equal to 2. So y is equal to minus 2. That makes sense. It's a horizontal line where y is equal to minus 2. That's the first equation. And the second equation then, I'll sub in 60 over 11. So that's 60 over 11 x minus y minus 2 times 60 over 11 minus 2 is equal to 0. I think I'll um, multiply out the brackets first. So 60x over 11 minus y minus 120 over 11 minus 2 is equal to 0. And then multiply across by 11 to get 60x minus 11y minus 120 minus 22 is equal to 0. So 60x minus 11y. Uh, minus 120 minus 22 is minus 142 uh, is equal to zero. So that is the equation of the second line. Okay, question three then, which is a probability question. So uh, the probability that a certain rugby player scores from each place kick he attempts is 85%. During a particular match, he takes five place kicks Find correct four decimal places the probability that he scores on exactly three of the five attempts. So I'll show you the way that I like to do this. So there is the formula for this, but I'm just going to show you how we actually build the formula. So he scores on exactly three of five attempts. So the probability that he scores is 0 0.85. Now put that in brackets. How many times do we want him to score? We want him to score three times. So it's to the power of three. We also want him to not score. The probability of him not scoring is 0 0.15. How many times do we want that to happen? We want that to happen twice. Now, how many ways can this happen? Scoring three and missing two. Well, that can happen five choose three times. Now, you should recognize this as your formula n over k times p to the power of k times q to the power of n minus k. And now we can type this straight into our calculator. So grabbing the calculator there, we type it straight in, use brackets. So it's 5 choose 3 times 0 0.85 to the power of 3 times 0 0.15 squared and that's oh made a mistake uh squared that is equal to 0 0.138178 now they want correct to four decimal places so that is equal to 0 0.1382 that's as a decimal um or it would be 13.82%. Uh, the next part then is putting a little, uh, a little restriction on it. Find the probability that he scores for the third time on his fifth attempt. So always do the restriction first. So his fifth attempt, he scores. So that's 0 0.85 happening there. Then what do we want on the other four attempts? We want him to score two, so that's 0 0.85 to the power of two, and we want him to miss two, so that's 0 0.15 to the power of two. It's also multiplied by the scoring on the last one. Now, how many ways can this thing here happen? That's uh, four choose two ways. So we can go straight back to our calculator, and we have uh, 4 choose uh, 2 times uh, 0 0.85 squared times 0 0.15 squared times 0 0.85, which is 
zero point zero eight two nine correct to four decimal places. Uh, part three then uh, find the probability that he scores on at least three attempts during the match. So at least three attempts could be that he scores three, scores four, or scores five. Now we already have the probability that he scores three. The probability that he scores three is zero point one three eight two so if we just find the probability that he scores four and the probability that he scores all five then uh, we can add them together and that'll be the answer so the probability that he scores four that's going to be five choose four times zero point eight five that's scoring four times times missing zero point one five once and on the calculator, we can go and we can say, so that is uh, 5, choose 4, times 0 0.85 to the power of 4, times 0 0.15 uh, to the power of 1. So we don't need to put the power in there. And that is equal to 0 0.3915. And then the probability that he scores all five is going to be 0 0.85 to the power of five. So 0 0.85 to the power of five. Is 0 0.4437 and then we add the three of them together. So it's a. Uh, that one plus this one, 0 0.3915 plus 0 0.1382, which gives us a total 0 0.9734, correct to four decimal places. Okay, and then on to part B. Uh, so A, B, and C are three events. A and B are independent. The probability of A is a third. The probability of A intersection B is a twelfth. The probability of C is a half. And the probability of B union C is five over eight. Find the probability of B intersection C and find or and investigate whether B and C are mutually exclusive. Okay, well, the first kind of bit of information we have is that A and B are independent. So independent events mean that the probability of A intersection B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Now we can use this to find the probability of B. So the probability of A intersection B is given to us, that's a twelfth. The probability of A is given to us, that's a third. And that is, leaves us with the probability of B. So the probability of B there will be um, a, a twelfth divided by one third. So one twelfth divided by one third is uh, three twelfths. So the probability of B is equal to three over 12 or uh, a quarter. So probability of B is a quarter. Now, to find the probability of B intersection C, um, we're going to go and use one of our other formulas, which we know, which is probability of B union C is equal to the probability of B plus the probability of C minus the probability of B intersection C. Now, you can see that we know uh, everything in here apart from B intersection C. So we can sub in and we'll be left with B intersection C. So the probability of B union C, that's 5 over 8. The probability of B was a quarter. And the probability of C, uh, probability of C is a half. Minus the probability of B 
intersection C. So 5 over 8 minus a quarter minus a half is equal to minus the probability of uh, B intersection C. So 5 over 8 minus a quarter minus a half is equal to minus the probability of B intersection C. So 5 over 8 minus uh, a quarter and minus a uh, half is minus 1 eighth. That's minus the probability of B intersection C. So that means then the probability of B intersection C is equal to 1 eighth. So that's the first part, find the probability of B intersection C and investigate whether events B and C are mutually exclusive. Well, what do we know about mutually exclusive events? The probability of uh, B intersection C, if they were mutually exclusive, that would be equal to zero. So this is equal to one over eight, which is not equal to zero. Therefore, uh, B and C are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so on to question four, which is our first trigonometry question. So let sine A equal to one over 10, uh, sorry, one over root 10, where A is greater than zero, but less than pi over four. Find sine of 2a and cos of 2a in the form of p over q, where p and q are elements of n. Okay, so uh, sine 2a, what we'll do first is we will draw a triangle here. And if sine a is 1 over 10, sine is opposite. If this was a, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so that would be 1 over root 10. So we could find this side here using Pythagoras. So this is, uh, let's just call it x there. So root 10 squared is equal to one squared plus x squared. Uh, root 10 squared is 10 minus one is equal to x squared. So x squared is equal to nine, x is equal to three. So that side there is three. Now we can find anything sine cos tan, anything about this triangle at all. So sine 2a, well, if we go to our log tables, uh, sine 2a is equal to 2 sine a cos a. So uh, we can write that in as 2 times sine a, well, we're already given that 1 over root 10. And cos a, cos is uh, adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's 3 over root 10. So that would be uh, 2 times 1 over root 10 times 3 over root 10. Two, time, uh, 2 times 1 times 3 is 6. And root 10 times root 10 is 10. So that's 6 over 10 or 3 over 5. We can do something similar here for cos of 2a. Cos 2a is equal to cos squared a sine, uh, sorry, minus uh, sine squared a. So that's again from the log tables. So filling that in. So cos squared a, well, cos a, we said was 3 over root 10. So squared uh, minus sine squared a. So sine a was 1 over root 10. So square that as well. Uh, so that's equal to squaring this. This will be 9 over 10 minus 1 over 10 which is 8 over 10 and 8 over 10 of course simplifies down to 4 over 5. So there's cos 2a and there is sine 2a. Now part 2. Uh, so by expressing sine 3a in the form of sine 2a plus a find the exact value of sine 3a and give your answer in the form of a root b over c. So uh, sine 2a in the form of sine 2a plus a. So sine 2a plus a. Well, this is similar to sine of 
a plus b in the log tables. So in the log tables, it'll be sine a cos b plus cos a sine b. Now, in this case, it'll be sine 2a cos a plus cos 2a sine a. So now I can actually fill in, I have uh, most of these things here. So that's sine 3a. I might just write that in as well. Sine 3a is equal to that. So sine 2a, I have that from part one. Uh, sine 2a is 3 over 5. Uh, cos a is 3 over root 10, again from part 1. Uh, cos 2a, I have that from part 1, that's 4 over 5. And then sine a, I also have from part 1, that's 1 over root 10. So that would be uh, 3 over 5 root 10 plus 4 over 5 root root 10. So that would be 7 over 5 root 10. Now they want that um, in the form of a root b over c. We want to basically get that square root on top. So what I'll do is I'll multiply above and below by root 10. So that would be equal to 7 root 10 over 5 root 10 by root 10 is 5 by 10. 5 by 10 is 50. So the answer then is uh, 7 root 10 over 50. Now, sorry, I've just uh, seen a mistake from the marking scheme. Obviously, 3 by 3 is 9, not 3. So that changes the 9 plus 4 to 13. So it's 13 root 10 over 50. Okay, over then to part B. Uh, express 2 cos squared x plus 3 sine x minus 3 equal to 0 as a quadratic equation in sine x. And hence find all the values of x uh, where x is between 0 and 2 pi and x is in radians. So the first thing uh, is to express this in terms of sine x. So basically we want to get this 2 cos squared x into sine x. Now how can we get cos squared x to be written in terms of sine x? From the log tables we know that cos squared x plus sine squared x is equal to 1. So that means cos squared x is equal to 1 minus sine squared x. So we can sub in that there up here. So that gives us the new equation 2 times 1 minus sine squared x plus 3 sine x minus 3 is equal to 0. Uh, multiply out there, so that's 2 minus 2 sine squared x plus 3 sine x minus 3 is equal to 0. And then just minus 3 plus 2 uh, will be minus 1. And then I'll just uh, change the sine of everything to have a leading, positive leading coefficient. So I get 2 sine squared x minus 3 sine x and then minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1 so it's now plus 1 is equal to 0. So that is my quadratic equation in terms of sine x. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write that in terms of say y to make it a little bit easier to, to factorize. So that would be if we say sine squared x is or sine x is equal to y that would be 2y squared minus 3y plus 1 is equal to 0. Now this is an easy enough quadratic equation. Most people should be able to factorize that no problem to get 2y minus 1 times y minus 1 is equal to 0. So that's 2y minus uh, or 2y is equal to 1. Uh, y is equal to a half and here y is equal to 1. Now what we did was we might just write in as well let y, let y equal to sine x. So now we have sine x is equal to a half and we have sine x is equal to 1. So we can go and solve each of them individually to uh, find our different values um, for x. So 
uh, sine inverse of a half is equal to x. Uh, sine inverse of a half is pi over 6. But don't forget our unit circle. I'll just draw it up here and cast. So uh, sine is positive in the first and the second quadrant. So it's pi over 6 and it's also going to be uh, pi over 6 be here. It's also going to be pi minus pi over 6. Pi minus pi over 6. Pi minus pi over 6 is 5 pi over 6. So that's my first two here and here. And then using sine x equal to 1. So the sine inverse of 1 is equal to x. So x then is equal to the sine inverse of 1, which is pi over 2. And pi over 2 is 90 degrees. So there is no uh, other one there. It's just bang on this line here between the first and second quadrants. So then I have three values of x. x is equal to pi over 6, pi over 2, and 5 pi over 6. Okay, so on to question five then. Uh, a bank issues a unique four digit PIN code to customers to use with their debit or credit cards. The code is chosen at random from the di digits zero to nine inclusive. A code cannot begin with zero, but digits may be repeated. So for example, 1995 is a valid code. Find a number of possible four digit PIN codes in which no digit is repeated as a percentage of the total possible codes and give your answer correct to one decimal place. So total codes then, well, it can start with any digit from one to nine, can start with zero. So there's nine choices for that. The second digit then can be anything. It can be zero to nine. So there's 10 choices for that. The third uh, digit, Again, there can be 10 choices because there can be repeats. And then the fourth digit, 10 choices again. So the total number of, of uh, codes that are possible is nine by 10 by 10 by 10, which is 9,000. Now, the codes with no repetition, so let's just say no uh, rep. So it has to start with uh, either one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. So we have nine choices. Now there's no repetition, so I can't repeat whatever I chose for the first one, but now I can include zero. So there's nine choices for the second digit. For the third digit, I've used two, so there's eight choices left. And for the fourth digit, I've used three of them, so there's seven choices left. So nine by nine by eight by seven is 4,536. So then we want to write that um, as a percentage of the total number of codes. So to write that as a percentage, it'll be 4, 5, 3, 6 over 9,000 uh, multiplied by 100, which is equal to 50.4%. Uh, part B. Uh, a PIN code in which no digit is repeated is issued to a customer. How many different PIN codes are, um, how many different PIN codes which are even numbers greater than 3000 are possible? Okay, well, if um, it's greater than 3000, that means that the first digit must be either three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. So, uh, but we also need to take into consideration that it's going to end uh, with 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. So there's a restriction there. So we've got two possibilities. So the first possibility is that it starts with a 3, 5, a 7, or a 9. So it starts with an odd number. So that's four choices. Then for the second digit, it can be anything uh, so long as it's not something that has been used. Uh, so that can be anything like, uh, actually, I'm going to do the restriction first. So I'm going to go down to the last number. So the last number has to be 
uh, an even number. So zero, two, four, six, or eight. So there's five choices there. And now I can fill in my other two. So the second number again, that can't be repeats. I've two used, so there's eight left. The third number I've three used, so there's seven left. So that means there's 1,120 choices there. Now we could also have a number that starts with four, six, or eight. So if it starts with four, six, or eight, there's three choices. Again, I'm gonna go and do my restriction first. Now it has to end with an even number, but I've already used one of the even numbers. So there's four even numbers left. And then in the middle then I can choose any other number. So there's eight choices because I've already chosen two. And then there's seven choices because I've already chosen three. So that is 672. So in total then 1120 plus 672 is 1792 choices. Now that's a little bit confusing. So if, uh, if you have any questions, just ask below, uh, but just maybe uh, replay it a couple of times and, and follow what I'm saying. Part two there, find the probability that all the digits in the PIN code issued are in ascending order. So for example, 3469 or 2789. Part two then, find the probability that all of the digits in the PIN uh, code issued are in ascending order. So if they're in ascending order, uh, so 3469 or 2789, if you think about any four digit, uh, any group of uh, combination of four digits, there's only one way you can put that in ascending order. Second thing to think about is you can't have a zero in it because if you had a zero in it, it would start with a zero, but our pin cannot start with a zero. So basically we have nine digits. We're choosing four from them. So the amount of number of possible codes in ascending order is nine choose four, which is 126. Now they're asking us to find the probability that we get one of these. So it's 126 out of how many codes there are with no repetition. So codes with no repetition we had from part A. So no repetition was from part A four, five, three, six, four thousand five hundred and thirty six. So then to get the probability of getting these out of these, it's one, two, six over four, five, three, six, which is equal to zero point zero two seven seven. Um correct to four decimal places. Uh, part C, uh, six students compare the months uh, in which they celebrate their birthdays. Assuming that all months are equally likely, find the probability that no two students were born on the same month and give your answer correct to four decimal places. So we want the probability that they were all born on a different month. So the first student can be born in any month. He has 12 choices out of 12. The second student then must be born on a different month. So the different month is 11 choices out of 12. The third student then would be 10 choices out of 12. And this will go on then. So all the way down, nine over 12 by eight over 12 by seven over 12. And type down into your calculator into a decimal mode is 0 0.228. Eight. No, sorry, just a mistake in the American scheme there. It's actually 0 0.2228. So on to question six. Uh, question six, uh, geometry question says, the length of the sides of the triangle ABC are nine units, 12 units, and 18 units as shown in the diagram. Each side is divided into three segments of equal length. Find the perimeter of the shaded region. OK, so, well, if each side is, is broken into three equal lengths, we can get these three easy enough. So this would be 12 divided by 3, which is 4. 
this would be 9 divided by 3, which is 3. And this would be 18 divided by 3, which is 6. But what about this side, this side, and this side? Well, let's look at this triangle here. This triangle here has sides uh, 4, 6, and an unknown side. Let's look at the angles that it has, though. It has the angles uh, A, uh, C, B, A, which is that one. But also these two angles here are the same as these angles here, okay, because of the way it's split uh, equally. So this triangle here is actually a similar triangle to this one. So if this is 4 and 6, this is 12 and 18, then this one is actually divided in the same ratio as over here. So that means that side is 3. And this is the same for all three triangles. So this one here is a third of this, which is 6. And this one here is a third of this one, which is 4. So the perimeter is equal to 3 plus 4 plus 6 plus 3 plus 4 plus 6, which is equal to 26 units. If the area of the triangle ABC is 48 units, find the area of the shaded region. So for part two, um, the area of the triangle, the big triangle ABC is 48. We want to find the shaded re region. So it's going to be basically the big triangle minus these three small triangles. So what can we say about these small triangles? Well, we had the scale factor uh, from before, uh, from part uh, one, but the scale factor is, is three. So when we deal with area, the area of uh, ABC, which is the big triangle, is equal to the scale factor K squared times the area of the small one. Let's say uh, this one, uh, we can call it A, D, E, if we say that's uh, D and that's E. So this uh, triangle A, D, E. Now I know that the scale factor uh, from before is three. So therefore K squared is equal to uh, three squared, which is nine. Now the area of A, D, E is gonna be then the area of A, B, C divided by uh, k squared. So the area of A, D, E is equal to the area of A, B, C divided by 9. Now the area of A, B, C is 48. So it's 48 over 9. Now this is going to be the case for all three of the triangles. So what we do is it's going to be 48 over 9 multiplied by 3. That's the three uh, white areas here. That's the area of them. So the area of the shaded region is just going to be 48 units minus that. So 48 minus 48 over 9 times 3, which is 32 units. Part B, uh, in the diagram, CD is parallel to AB, uh, and AC, AC is perpendicular to AB. AD and BC, AD and BC intersect at the point zero, uh, or the point O. AB is 11 units, CD is nine units, and AC is 12 units. Prove that uh, triangles ABO, so ABO is this triangle here, and CDO, which is this triangle here, are similar. Now, similar triangles means they have um, all angles are the same. So uh, we can say, first of all, that this angle is equal to this angle. So that's uh, angle uh, BOA is equal to angle COD. And you have to give a reason for that as well. So vertically opposite, uh, vertically opposite. Now you do have to write down the statement 
and the reason for each one of them. So then we can say uh, the angle OAB, this angle here, is equal to the angle ODC, which is this angle here. And the reason for that is they are alternate angles. So again, you have to write it down. So angle uh, OAB is equal to angle ODC. And the reason there is alternate. And then you can give the last one there. So that one is equal to that one. Um, so angle uh, A, B, O is equal to angle uh, O, C, D. And the reason for that, uh, we can just say uh, three angles in a triangle. And then therefore, triangle A, B, O and triangle uh, C, D, O are similar. And then on to part two, uh, find the length AD and hence find uh, the length OD. So AD there, uh, let's just draw a little sketch of what we have. We have this triangle here, uh, which is A, D, C. I have 12, I have nine, and this is a right angle. So AD is just using Pythagoras. So uh, AD is equal to the square root of 12 squared plus nine squared. So uh, AD then is equal to the square root of 144 plus 81, which is 225. So square root of 225, which is 15. So AD then is 15. Now, hence find OD. Now, this is uh, going to bring us back to part one, uh, just saying that ABO and CDO are similar. So I'll say here uh, ADO and CDO are similar. And what that means is uh, OD, the length OD over the length C, um, over the length CD, which is this one here, is equal to uh, the length AO, which is this one here, over the length AB, which is this one here. Now we know uh, which ones we know. We know uh, CD, which is nine, and we know AB, which is eleven. Now, OD and AO, we can write in terms of X. So if we say we let that equal to X, so OD, this one here would be 15 minus X. So let's fill in. So OD is 15 minus X. Uh, then CD, uh, OD, sorry, OD was just X, not 15 minus X. So OD was X. And then CD, uh, CD is 9. Then AO was our 15 minus X. And then AB is 11. So I have this X over 9 is equal to 15 minus X over 11. So we can multiply across by 9 and across by 11 to get 11X is equal to 9 times 15 minus X. So 11x is equal to uh, 9 times 15 is 135 minus 9x. 9x added to 11x is 20x is equal to 135. x then, sorry, x is equal to 135 divided by 20, which is 6.75 units. OK, so then just to write in what the answers are here, AD was 15 and OD was 6.75. So on to part B then, uh, question 7, uh, trigonometry uh, question here. Uh, an inverted right circular cone with its uh, axis vertical is filled with water to a depth of 15 centimetres uh, above its vertex, as shown. The semi 
semi-vertical uh, angle of the cone is 30 degrees. So uh, that's uh, the angle there that's given to you. Find or the radius of the circular surface of the water of the cone and give your answer in the form of A root B. So um, we can just use trigonometry here and draw this triangle. We're given uh, the height is 15. So we can write 15 in here. Uh, we're given this angle 30. And this is what we want here or. So this is a right angle triangle. So all we're going to use is uh, tan, which is opposite over adjacent. So tan 30 degrees is equal to or over 15. So then or is equal to 15 tan 30. And you can go 15 tan 30 uh, straight into your calculator, which is 5 root 3. So or is equal to 5 root 3. Hence, find the volume of water in the cone in terms of pi. So the volume of a cone formula is uh, V is equal to one third uh, pi or squared H. So volume then is going to be one third times pi times or squared. So that's uh, five root three squared times H, which is 15. So V is equal to a third pi, uh, five root three squared, uh, five by five is 25, uh, root three by root three is three, so three times 25 is 75, and then uh, times 15. And then a third by 75 by 15 is equal to 375. And we leave pi there because we want it in terms of pi. And don't forget your units there are going to be cm cubed. Part B then of this question. A solid sphere of radius A is placed in the cone. The water rises up to just cover the sphere, um, which touches the sides of the cone. So the, the sphere is touching the sides of the cone and it's just touching the surface of the water as well. Find D, the depth of the water, and or the radius of the uh, circular surface of the water in terms of A. So D, the depth of the water, is given here, but it's also from this point up to this point here. Now, I know that this much of it, that's just a radius of the sphere, so that's A. So if I can find this much here, let's call it H, then I can add it to A to get uh, D. So that is similar to the last one where we just have a triangle. Uh, this is A, uh, this is 30 degrees, and now actually in this case, because this is a radius here, this is the right angle. So I'll just put in that as the right angle there. I know the, the diagram uh, isn't, uh, looks like that is the right angle, but this one is the right angle. So if I want to find H, okay, it's going to be opposite over adjacent. Um, sorry, it's, but this, is, uh, this is the hypotenuse, sorry. So it's going to be opposite over hypotenuse, which is sine. So sine of 30 degrees is equal to A over H. Now I want H in terms of A, so I'm going to isolate H. So multiply across by H and then divide by sine 30. So H is equal to A over sine 30. And uh, sine 30 is um, 2. Uh, 1 over 2, so that would be A over 1 over 2. So H is equal to A divided by half. So A divided by half then is 2A. So H is equal to 2A. So then D then is equal to 2A plus A, which is 3A. So that is uh, D. Now we want to find or the radius of this uh, pool of water at the top. So I can draw another triangle again like this. So this is this one here. Again, I have a 30 degree angle. Now this is my or that I'm looking for. 
and this length here is 3a. So writing everything, um, I want or in terms of a. So this is opposite over adjacent, so it's tan. So tan 30 degrees is equal to or over 3a. Now I want or, so or is equal to 3a tan 30. Now the tan of 30 is root 3 over 3, so that's or is equal to 3a times root 3 over 3. Well, the trees will cancel, so or is equal to root 3a. And then hence find a, the radius of the sphere, correct to two decimal places. So for this one, um, I need to find some sort of relationship. So the relationship that I have is the volume of the cone is equal to the volume of the water plus the volume of the sphere. Now, the cone being uh, the, the cone of water, not the full cone up here. So um, I can figure out all of these in terms of uh, A, and then I can use that to find A. So starting with the volume of the cone, the volume of the cone is a third pi or squared h. And the volume of the water, I know the volume of the water from a uh, previous question, so or from uh, a part two, the volume of the water is 375 pi. And then the volume of the sphere then is four over three pi or cubed. So now I can um, replace everything, uh, replace or uh, with root three a, um, and then I'd be able to figure it out from there. Okay, so uh, the volume of the cone, pi, uh, third pi or squared h. So uh, the or for uh, the volume of the cone is root three a, so that's one third pi times root 3a, and then h, uh, which is the height of the cone, is 3a, so times uh, 3a is equal to 375 pi plus 4 over 3 pi. Now, for the sphere, uh, or the radius of the sphere is a, so a cubed. So now I have an equation here with only one unknown, and the unknown is a. So I should be able to uh, to work that out from there. So over here, uh, a third pi times um, root three a times three a. So three times a third is one. So they cancel. So I am left with uh, root three a squared. Uh, root three uh, pi a squared is equal to 375 plus uh, 4 over 3 pi a cubed. So just notes in there that we should actually, these should match up. So or squared, this is uh, root 3 times a. Uh, that's actually to be squared. We didn't square that yet. So that should be squared. Um, so that means root 3 by root 3 is actually 3, so we can get rid of that square root sign, and then a squared by a is a cubed. So I have 3 pi a cubed is equal to 375 pi plus 4 over 3 pi a cubed. So let's take all the a's to one side and leave the numbers on the other. So 3 pi a cubed minus 4 over 3 pi a cubed cubed is equal to uh, 375 pi. Um, we have pi common to everything, so I can get rid of the pi's, uh, divide everything by pi, which simplifies it a little bit. Uh, and then it's 3a cubed minus 4 over 3a cubed. Well, that's 5 over 3a cubed, and that's equal to 375. So a cubed then is equal to 375 divided by 
five over three. Uh, so 375 divided by five over three, which is equal to uh, 225. So then uh, A is equal to the cubed root of 225, uh, which is equal to 6.08. Okay, so moving on then to part C of this question. Um, so a buoy at C consists of a cone mounted on a heavy cylindrical base which floats with the cone uppermost. So it floats this way up. Uh, the buoy has an overall height of six meters uh, and the cone and cylinder have equal volumes and equal radii. So uh, radius here is the same and the volume of the cone is equal to the volume of the cylinder. Part one, find the vertical height of the cone. So to do this, um, what we should do is draw a center line down here. And if we let the height of the cone, which is what we're looking for, be h, then the height of the cylinder is six minus h. Now, what do we know from the question? We know that um, the cone and the cylinder have equal volumes. So the volume of the cone is equal to the volume of the uh, cylinder. So the cone, volume of the cone is one third uh, pi or squared h. Um, and the volume of the cylinder is pi or squared uh, h, which is six minus h. Now, I know that the radius um, is equal in both of them, okay? So I can actually get rid or divide both sides by or squared. That leaves me with one third h is equal to, uh, sorry, one third pi h is equal to pi times six minus h. Uh, I can also divide both sides by pi to get one third h is equal to 6 minus h. So then 6 is equal to 1 third h plus h. So 6 is equal to uh, 1 third plus uh, 1 is 4 over 3 h. So then h is equal to 6 divided by 4 over 3. Uh, 6 divided by 4 over 3 is 4.5 and its units are meters. Part two, the diameter of the cone um, and cylinder is 2.5 meters. Find the total volume of the buoy in terms of pi. So um, we know from before that the volume of the cone is equal to the volume of the cylinder. So we can just do uh, total volume is equal to twice uh, the volume of the cone. Okay, so just taking one of them. So that's equal to two times uh, the volume of the cone, which is one third uh, pi or squared h. Now we know that uh, the volume of the, or the height of the cone h we figured was 4.5 from before. The diameter is 2.5, so that means the radius is 1.25. So that's two times one third uh, pi uh, times pi times or squared, so that's 1.25. Uh, 25 squared times uh, the height there, which we found out was 4.5. So uh, that's 2 times a third times 1.25 squared times 4.5 is 4.6875 pi. And on to part three of this one then. So the buoy floats uh, with its axis vertical and two thirds of its volume submerged below the waterline. Find the height of the vertex of the cone above the waterline. So let's just draw a quick uh, diagram of it here. So here's the, uh, the buoy. And remember this uh, part and this part have equal volumes. If two thirds of it is below the water, that means one third of it is above the water one third of the volume that is. So it's gonna be all of the cylindrical part and part of the conical part are below the water. 
So the volume uh, above is one third of the total volume. Now the total volume we have from before uh, was 4.6875 pi. Now just to have that as a fraction will be easier. Um, so it's one third times 75 pi over 16. One third of that is 25 uh, pi over 16. So that's the volume of the cone that is above the water. Now, if we take the bit, let's take the cone, okay? Um, so here's the cone, and part of it is above the water. Now, I know the height of the cone is 4.5, and I know that the radius of the cone is 1.25. But I don't know what this new radius is here. Let's call it x. And this new height here, let's call it y. I don't know what they are. But I can use similar triangles. I can say that x over y is equal to 1.25 over 4.5. So I can write x in terms of y there, so x is equal to 1.25y over 4.5. Now, the volume of the cone above the waterline, I can find now find that in terms of y. So the volume above is equal to a third pi r squared h. Now, or is this, uh, or is x, which is this, and h is y. So, or is going to be 1.25y over 4.5. That's squared. And then h is my y. So now I have the volume of the cone written in terms of y. I also have the volume of the cone up here. So I have an equation. 25 pi over 16 is equal to a third pi times 1.25y over 4.5 squared times y. So that, that gives me an equation where I just have one unknown, which is y, and I can find that. And it's that's what I'm looking for, the height of the vertex of the cone above the waterline. Here's the waterline. Here's the height. So if I can find y, then uh, that's the answer. So I can divide both sides by pi, there like that. Um, I can multiply in, uh, let's go with uh, 25 over 16 is equal to a third times uh, 1.25y over 4.5, and we have to square it. So uh, let's square 1.25. Uh, so 1.25 squared is uh, 1.5625 uh, y squared over 4.5 squared. 4.5 uh, squared is uh, 20.25. And that's times y again. Um, so 25 over 16 is equal to... I can multiply in by the third and by the y. So on the top, I get 1.5625y cubed. And on the bottom, I get 20.25 by three, which is 60.75. And then I can multiply across by 16 and multiply across by 25. So on the left-hand side, I will get uh, 1518.75 and on the right hand side it's 16 by 1.5625 which is 25 y cubed. So y cubed is equal to 1518.75 uh, divided by 25 which is 60.25. And then if I want y, I take the cube root of that. 
So uh, the cubed root uh, of 60.75 is equal to uh, y is equal to 3.93 and that's meters. So question eight, uh, farmed salmon are harvested when they grow to a certain length. The lengths of the salmon produced in a particular offshore fish farm are normally distributed with a mean of 32.8 centimetres and a standard deviation of 2.4 centimetres. Find the proportion of salmon which are more than 35 centimetres in length. Okay, so to find the proportion of uh, salmon here, we're going to use our z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. Okay, so um, that is the z of 35 is equal to uh, x, which is 35, uh, minus mu, so minus uh, 32.8 over sigma. Uh, sigma is 2.4. So our Z score uh, for 35 is equal to 0 0.9166, uh, which is uh, approximately equal to uh, 0 0.92. Uh, so we're going to go and find uh, the probability uh, that uh, X is greater than 35. Okay, That's equal to the probability that our Z score is greater than 0 0.92. So we found our Z score just there a moment ago. So we can go to our Z tables um, and find uh, the probability that Z is less than 0 0.92. So to find the probability that Z is greater than 0 0.92, that would be equal to one minus uh, the Z score for 0 0.92. Go to your log tables, you'll find the Z score for 0 0.92 is 0 0.8212. So it's one minus that, which is equal to 0 0.1788, um, which is equal to 17.88%. Um, so I suppose, well, it wanted the proportion, so a proportion would be uh, 0 0.1788 of them are above 35 centimetres in length. Okay, let's have a look at question two. So question two, on further analysis, it was determined that 60% of the salmon produced in the fish farm have lengths of between 31.8 centimetres and T centimetres. Find the value of T. So to start this one off, uh, let's find the Z score for uh, for 31.8. Uh, so that would be 31.8 minus 32.8 over 2.4, which works out to be uh, approximately uh, minus 0 0.42. Okay, so we'll just hold on to that one for a second. Um, let me draw actually the curve. So if we drew the curve like this, okay, and we had our mean around about here. So this is what I just found there at minus 0 0.42. And then there's some other number here, let's call it K. And all of this region here is 60%. Okay, so we found that 0 0.42 anyway. Now let's uh, have a look at um, the, trying to find this value here, k. So um, we want to find the value of t. Now the value of t, so let's find the z score for t. The z score for t would be t minus uh, 32.8 over 2.4. Now how can we put them together? Well, the probability that uh, our number is between the 31.8, uh, so greater than or equal to 31.8 and less than or equal to T is equal to the probability of uh, our Z score being greater than or equal to minus 0 0.42 
but less than or equal to this here, t minus 32.8 over 2.4. But we also know that that is equal to 0 0.6. So we have a bit of an equation here that we can work on. Now, the first bit, so the probability that z is a uh, is greater than or equal to 0 0.42 or minus 0 0.42. We can solve that uh, by doing P of Z greater than or equal to 0 0.42, which is one minus the probability uh, that Z is less than or equal to 0 0.42. Go to your Z, uh, your Z score tables um, and get 0 0.42, so that'll be equal to 1 minus 0 0.6628, which is equal to 0 0.3372. Okay, so let's save that number for a second. Now, the probability that the P of uh, Z being uh, less than or equal to K, now the P of Z being less than or equal to K is equal to or 0 0.6 plus uh, this bit here, which is our 0 0.3372. So less than K is the 60% plus the 3372. Um, so that is equal to 0 0.9372. Now we can get our K. So if you go to your Z tables, your Z score tables, look for 9372, that will give you a K value of 1.53. So now I have an equation, 1.53 is equal to this here, which is T minus 32.8 over 2.4. Uh, multiply across by 2.4, so that'll be T minus 32.8 is equal to 1.53 by 2.4, which is 3.672. So that means T is equal to 3.672 plus 32.8, which is uh, approximately 36.47 centimeters, uh, correct to two decimal places. There was a good bit in that question. So if you have, uh, if you're wondering about it, just uh, follow through the question again and use your Z score, uh, your Z tables uh, to help you with it. Uh, part B then, uh, the owners of the fish farm have introduced new practices to produce salmon in larger, less densely populated cages, which allow the fish to follow their natural shoaling behavior. In a random sample of 250 salmon produced in this way, it was found that their lengths were normally distributed with a mean of 33.2 centimeters and the same standard deviation. So the standard deviation uh, from before was 2.4 centimeters. Uh, test the hypothesis at the 5% level of significance that the mean length of the salmon produced has not changed. State the null hypothesis and your alternative hy hy hypothesis and give your conclusion in the context of the question. Okay, so um, our null hypothesis, so H0, uh, is that uh, the mu is equal to 32.8, so that it has not changed. And then our alternative hypothesis, then H1, is that mu is not equal to 32.8, so it has changed. Okay, so um, how do we do this? So first of all, we convert the observed uh, result to a Z score. So Z is equal to uh, X bar minus mu over uh, sigma over root N. So that is equal to 33.2 minus 32.8 over 2.4 over the square root of n, which is 250. Uh, so that works out to be um, 
I'll just skip through the calculations there. That works out to be a 2.64. The Z score of 2.64. Uh, now, um, so the conclusion. So, um, as 2.64 is greater than 1.96, remember 1.96 is the value that uh, we are always looking for at this 95% uh, level of, of significance. Uh, what we'll say is we reject the null hypothesis and test and accept. So reject H0 and uh, accept H1. And then uh, give your conclusion in the, in the context of the question. Uh, we can conclude that there is sufficient evidence to suggest the mean length has changed. Uh, so sufficient evidence to suggest that the mean has changed. And just make sure that you're answering each part of this question. There was actually uh, four parts. So test the hypothesis at the 5% level. Uh, state the null hypothesis, state the alternative hypothesis, and give the conclusion. So null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, test, and conclusion. Uh, part two then uh, is find the p-value of the test you performed in B part one and explain what this value represents in the context of the question. So to calculate the p-value, First of all, we get the Z score. So the Z score was 2.64. We go to our uh, Z tables and we find uh, that uh, our P is equal to 0 0.0041. But remember, we need to multiply that by two for both tails. So that means we have uh, multiplied by two which is equal to 0 0.0082. Explain what this value represents in the context of the question. Well, this is less than 0 0.05, which is our 5% level of significance. So that means, just like before, we reject H0 and accept H1. Okay, over then to part C of this question. Uh, farmed trout are produced in freshwater fish farms. In a particular fish farm, the lengths of the trout produced are normally distributed, with 97.5% of them having lengths of less than 34.2, and 67% of them having lengths of greater than 26.6. Uh, Find the mean and standard deviation of the lengths of the trout produced in this fish farm and give your answer correct to two decimal places. Right, so uh, to tackle this one, um, we're going to get uh, our Z score, uh, which was 0 0.975, uh, so the 97.5%. If we go and look up uh, the Z tables, that'll be a Z score of um, or sorry, a uh, value of K, if I do this here, um, so this value um, will be, let's call it K, K is equal to 1.96, so that's coming from your Z tables there. Um, we can then say Z is equal to X minus mu over sigma. What do we know here? We know Z is 1.96, uh, we know x is 34.2 uh, minus mu over sigma. Uh, we can maybe write sigma or isolate sigma here to get multiply across by sigma and divide by 1.96. Sigma is equal to 34.2 minus mu over 1.96. Okay, we'll remember that one uh, for further on. We also know from the question 
uh, that 67% of them have lengths greater than uh, 26.6. So we can do something similar there. Uh, if 67% of them have lengths greater than 26.6, that means that 33% of them have uh, lengths less than 26.6. So we can say that uh, we can look up the z-score for 0 0.67 and that will give us uh, 0 0.44 from the z-tables and then we can call this other value t, let's say it's, it's there, so um, t is equal to x minus mu over sigma. Uh, now our t is 0 0.44 over here though it's minus 0 0.44 is equal to our x which is 26.6 minus mu uh, over sigma and again let's isolate sigma so sigma is equal to 26.6 minus mu over minus 0 0.44 so now i have sigma is equal to this and i have sigma is equal to this so i can put them together and that should get me an equation with mu that I can solve. So 34.2 minus mu over 1.96 is equal to 26.6 minus mu over minus 0 0.44. Uh, I can multiply across by 1.96 and by minus 0 0.44. Um, So uh, zero minus 0 0.44 times 34.2 minus mu is equal to 1.96 times 26.6 minus mu. Okay, so um, let's get the calculator here and uh, minus 0 0.44 times uh, 34.2 is equal to minus 15.048 minus by minus is plus 0 0.44 mu is equal to 1.96 by 26.6 which is 52.136 52.136 minus 1.96 mu. Mu is to one side, numbers to the other, so 0 0.44 mu plus 1.96 mu is equal to uh, 52.136 plus 15.048. So that works out, uh, adding these together and dividing, we end up getting uh, mu is equal to uh, 27.99 centimeters. So uh, that is the mean. Mean is 27.99 centimeters. And then if we want to get our standard deviation, we can use either of these ones here. So sigma is equal to 34.2 minus 27.99 over 1.96 and that works out to be approximately 3.17 centimeters 3.17 centimeters okay so on to question nine the last question in this paper uh, so a television television mast is held in a vertical position by two metal supports a a um A, E, and C, D. Um, I actually think it should be A, D, and C, E. Uh, anyway, and a wire cable A, F. Uh, a, D is 2.4. A, F is 3.7. D, F um, is 1.8. D, F 1.8. Uh, C, E is 2.9. And the angle B, C, E is 48. Find B, E correct to two decimal places. So that's this length here, B to E. So that'll just be a little right angle triangle. 
where we have 48 degrees. We have uh, 2.9 meters there. Um, and we want to find this length here. Let's call it X. So uh, that would be opposite over hypotenuse. So that would be sine. Uh, so the sine of 48 degrees is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So then uh, X is equal to 2.9 sine 48 degrees, which is 2.16 meters. Uh, find the angle ADF correct to the nearest degree. So ADF is this angle here correct to the nearest degree. So for this one, we're going to use the cosine rule. So uh, we have the three sides and we want the angle. So uh, cosine rule, I would start by writing it down. A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cos A. And we're looking for A there. Uh, so A squared, 3.7 squared is equal to 2.4 squared plus 1.8 squared minus 2 times 2.4 times 1.8 cos A. Now what I would do here is I would just uh, rearrange everything without doing any calculations yet. So 3.7 minus 2 uh, squared minus 2.4 squared minus 1.8 squared divided by minus 2 by 2.4 by 1 uh, 1.8 is equal to cos a, cos a. So if I want to find a, it's cos inverse of that. So cos inverse of this here. Is equal to a so you can go to your calculator and see uh, type in uh, inverse cause cause inverse of this here and you should get a equal to 120 uh, 2.87 to the nearest degree approximately 123 degrees uh, hence find ef correct to two decimal places so ef is this uh, length here correct to two decimal places. So to find EF, uh, which is this one here, um, what we can do is, first of all, it's, it was, so it's saying hence uh, find EF correct to two decimal places. So there's a hint in there. We've just found this angle here, which is one, two, three. So that means this angle here is 180 minus one, two, three. Uh, 180 minus one, two, three is 57 degrees. Okay, so you might just write that in uh, angle uh, ADB is equal to 180 minus 123, which is equal to 57 degrees. Okay, so we can now use that uh, to start finding some lengths here. Um, we know that DF is 1.8. If we can find BD, that'll give us the total length of the pole and then we can take away uh, ED and uh, D or DE I suppose uh, to get FE. So um, the length uh, DB, uh, DB, this one here, uh, we can do uh, adjacent over hypotenuse so that would be um, cosine of 57 so cosine of uh, 57 degrees is equal to uh, db over uh, 2.4. So that means uh, db, uh, db is equal to 2.4 uh, cos 57. So db, the length db, is equal to 1.307 meters, 1.307 meters. Now the total length of the pole, which is BF, BF is gonna be equal to uh, DB 
plus uh, df. So we have though two of them so far. So uh, db is 1.307 uh, and df was 1.8. So that's equal to 3.107. That's bf. And then to get ef, which is the last bit, ef, that is equal to bf, which is the total length minus be. Uh, which is uh, the length that we found uh, before, uh, which is 3.107 um, 3 minus uh, the 2.16, that's from part one, uh, which is equal to 0 0.95 meters. Uh, part B then, the summer season in a certain holiday resort runs from 15th of April to 30th of September inclusive. The number of visitors to the resort in thousands, uh, NT can be approximated by the function NT is equal to 4.8 minus 2.6 cosine pi over 84 times T, where T is the number of days after April 15th and uh, pi over 84 T is expressed in radians. Find the number of visitors to the resort on the 13th of May and they tell you that that is 28 days after the 15th of April. So we are just going to find the N of 28. So the N of 28 would be 4.8 minus 2.6 cosine uh, pi over 84 times 28. So you can go straight into your calculator with all of that, and that should give you 3.5, and that is 3,500, uh, uh, so which is equal to 3,500 visitors. I find the largest number of visitors to the resort and the date on which this occurs. So if you look at the function here, we're looking for the largest number of visitors. Uh, 4.8 is a positive number. So this bit here, minus 2.6 cause of this, when this bit is uh, the biggest, uh, a positive number, the biggest positive number possible, that'll be the, the largest um, number of visitors to the resort. Now, cosine is between minus one and plus one. So when this part here is either minus one or plus one, it will be at the max. Minus 2.6 by minus one will give us positive 2.6. So that will be when the largest numbers are. So n of t is equal to 4.8 minus 2.6 times minus one. So that's equal to 4.8 plus 2.6 which is equal to 7.4, which is equal to 7,400 uh, visitors. So when uh, it also asks for the date on which this occurs. So to find that, we want to do uh, the cause of pi over 84 uh, t is equal to minus 1, uh, the minus 1 that we just used. So the cos inverse of minus 1 is equal to pi over 84 t. So then um, t up here, t is equal to uh, the cos inverse of minus 1 over uh, pi over 84. And you can put that straight into your calculator as it is. So you get t is equal to 84 days after the 15th of the 4th, 15th of April. Uh, so 15th of April, um, adding on 84 days will bring you up to the 8th of July. Uh, find the period and the range of n of t and hence draw a rough sketch of nt on the axis below. 
Okay, so to find the period of um, the function, uh, the easiest way I think would be to count the number of days between April uh, 15th uh, to um, September 30th. So we have then April, May, June, July, August and September. April starting on the 15th has 15 days left. May has 31 days. Uh, June has 30 days. July has 31 days, August has 31 days, and September has 30 days. So the total number of days is the period, which is 168 days. Then to find the range, um, the range, well, we already have the upper end of the range. We found uh, here 7,400. That was 4.8 plus 2.6. Well, the lower end of that, will be when this is a positive one and it's minus 2.6. So 4.8 minus 2.6 uh, is equal to uh, 2.2. So then the range is 2.2 to 7,400, um, no, 2.2 to 7.4 or uh, 2,200 to 7,400, so whichever uh, way up you suppose you want to give it. And then to sketch a graph of this, so we have n of t and we have t. Um, now, t is in radians, so we have pi over four, pi over two, uh, three pi over four, and pi. And then on this axis, we'll go up uh, two, four, six, eight, 10. Um, we have a max here was 7,400, which you could put around about there. And we have a min of 2,200, which will be at the start and at the end. So we would have a graph that looks approximately like this here. Uh, over to part four, find the two dates on which the number of visitors to the resort is approximately 3,851. So for this, we just let uh, 3851, put that uh, as a decimal, uh, 3.851 uh, is equal to, the function was 4.8 minus 2.6 uh, cosine uh, pi over 84 t okay so if we solve this and we'll get a uh, t so 3.851 minus 4.8 and um, 3.851 minus 4.8 and i'm also going to divide by minus 2.6 That'll be equal to cosine of pi over 84 uh, t. So uh, the cos inverse of this thing here, 3.851 minus 4.8 over minus 2.6, uh, that will be equal to pi over 84 t. Uh, so that is equal to, if you go to the calculator, that's equal to 1.197163. Uh, so then T is equal to that, 1.197.1, uh, uh, sorry, 163 divided by pi over 84. So T is uh, approximately 32 days. Okay, so the, the two dates then, are going to be uh, the 15th of April, so the 15th of the 4th plus 32 uh, days, uh, which is equal to uh, the 17th of May. And then for the other date, we have to find uh, the value in, go to our unit circle, uh, cast, um, so we're looking at uh, cosine so that first this one was the first quadrant now we're looking at the second or the, the last quadrant rather so the last quadrant is 
um, 2 pi minus or 1.9 uh, 1 uh, which is equal to 5.086021 so then our t is equal to 5.086021 divided by pi over 84 uh, which is equal to 136 days so it's the 15th of April plus 136 days which brings you up to uh, the 29th of August And then the final question uh, on this paper, find the rate at which the number of visitors to the holiday resort is changing on the 19th of August, 126 days after the 15th of April. And then explain your answer in context of the question. So the rate, it's a, it's a rate of change, uh, basically. So we're going to differentiate. So we have our n of t is equal to 4.8 minus 2.6 cosine uh, pi over 84t. So differentiate this to get n dash of t. Uh, differentiate 4.8, you get 0. Now differentiate minus 2.6 cosine pi over 84t. What you get is minus 2.6 times the pi over 84. And then cosine is minus sine. So times minus sine of pi over 84 t. And then we want to let t equal to 126 uh, to see what we get there. So subbing in 126, so that's equal to minus 2.6 times pi over 84 times minus sine of pi over 84 times 1, 2, 6. So straight into the calculator with that, and that should give you um, an answer of minus 0 0.097239, uh, which means it's minus 97.24 uh, people. And then just in the context of the question, um, the number of visitors is decreasing by 97 per day. So number of visitors decreasing by 97 per day. Okay, so uh, that was uh, paper two. Um, if you have any questions, obviously just ask them in the comments below. Um, if you need to go back over any questions, I'll put the timestamps in uh, the comment section and in the description. Um, and again, look, if there's any questions, just ask.